First of all, I would like to express my happiness and joy that all of you have come here interested in studying the Dhamma. I would also like to thank each and every one of you for helping to make this place useful and beneficial. The thing that I would like to speak with you about today is how and what benefits can we get from the study of Dhamma. If, if you receive any benefits from Buddhism, then you will be a Buddhist whether or not you go through any conversion ceremony or not. Whether you are converted or not converted is absolutely meaningless. What does matter, what is important, is if you get anything useful from Buddhism. Therefore, we will talk about things that you can receive from Buddhism. If you know that you have gotten some benefit from Buddhism, then you know what Buddhism is. Then you know what Buddhism is about. Until you know what you have gotten, what you have received from Buddhism, you will know nothing about Buddhism. So let's talk about these things that you can get from Buddhism. Then, then will you, you will know Buddhism and you will become a Buddhist automatically. First, you will receive the best thing which human beings can receive. You will receive the highest thing that humans can attain. And this thing is the thing that you ought to receive more than any other thing. We can call it, in short, a few words, we can say that this thing is a new life, a new life. Therefore, let's speak about the characteristics of a new life. For now, I'd like every, each and every one of you to forget all about whatever, whatever fates, you have belonged to whatever sex you have belonged to and whatever beliefs you have. For the time being, forget about all these so that you can understand what is going to be said now. So put all those things, all those beliefs aside for the time being. Even if you're a believer in science more than any so-called religion, Put that aside for the time being as well. Actually, Buddhism has many things in common with science, but it is a science of the mind, science of the spirit, rather than science of physical things. And for that reason, it will be something new for you. first thing I'd like you to be aware of is that Buddhism is a medicine. It is a cure for disease. This is a very strange and special medicine because this medicine can be taken by everyone. It doesn't matter what religion you follow. It doesn't matter what country you come from what your ethnic background is, what language you speak, what education you have. It has nothing to do with your personal situation. Everyone can use this medicine. 
The Dhamma is like modern medicines, modern drugs, which are meant to cure physical diseases. These drugs can be taken by people all over the world, no matter what their religion, their language, their country, or their background, people all over the world can use these drugs in order to, co to cure physical diseases. The Dhamma is like this also. It's like aspirin. No matter where we're from, we can take a few aspirin to get rid of a headache. So the Dhamma is a medicine which can cure rog. Rog is a Thai word which comes from a Pali word. It is usually translated disease. But I'd like you to be aware, to think of this, this Thai word, this Pali word, rog, because it has a, a meaning which is a little more useful than the word disease. It means something that stabs and penetrates. So the Dhamma is something that can cure this stabbing, this penetrating, this rogue. Rogue. We're not really sure what this word disease means, so we'd rather use this word rogue, which we, we know the meaning of it. It means to stab, to penetrate, mm -hmm. to thrust. This rogue we're talking about is spiritual. This is what we're most concerned with. So this is, we can call it spiritual disease. Physical diseases stab our body, stab the body. Spiritual disease stabs the mind. It stabs the spirit. If, if we don't have any spiritual disease, it's just a waste of time to come and study Buddhism, to study the Dhamma. Therefore, everyone should take a close look and get to know these two kinds of diseases, physical disease, disease of the body, and spiritual disease, rogue, of mm -hmm. the mind, of the spirit. Come to know both kinds of diseases and look at yourselves. Right now, is there any spiritual disease in me? Am I free of spiritual disease or am I, am I enduring it? So we begin the study of Dhamma by getting to know the diseases that we are suffering from. We come to see the disease that is stabbing our minds, our spirits. You must look and observe within yourself and see what diseases, what spiritual diseases are going on what they're like, what they're about. You must look inside. If we don't do this, then we won't have a proper beginning to the study of Buddhism. Unless we have knowledge of this disease that we are suffering from, then we will just be studying Buddhism in a foolish and aimless way. Actually, most people will have some knowledge of your spiritual disease. But most people, for most people, for most of you, this knowledge will be small or fuzzy. It won't be very clear. So next, before anything else, we'll talk about spiritual disease a little bit to make it clearer to help you understand and see spiritual disease within yourselves. So we can, the first group of diseases are all the problems which disturb, which bother, which pester the mind. And these are all, ba these are based in aging, 
getting old, illness, and death. So this is the first group of spiritual disease. We all have problems that result from the fact that we all must get old, that we all get sick, and that we will all die. These problems, these problems are the first thing we need to look at, the, the primary source of spiritual disease. And then there is some miscellaneous problems, general miscellaneous problems, which are based on the fact that we are often, or we are separated from the things we love, that we have to meet up with things we don't like, that we have to experience things we do not like, we do not love, and that the things we desire, we don't get. So, the things we love, we are separated from. We experience things we do not love, and our desires are not fulfilled. These cause problems and spiritual disease. Before anything else, each of you must know these rogue, these diseases, these problems within that you experience yourselves, within yourselves. And that's why we have the principle that the Dhamma must be studied and learned inwardly, not externally, within, not without. So learn these things from life. Learn them from all the things that you experience within this body, this two meter or thereabouts long body, or fathom long body. The things we learn from outside ourselves, such as from books, these things may be useful, but they are not enough. They are not enough to cure the spiritual disease. So we need to study within. Only by looking within can we come to understand these spiritual diseases completely. This external kind of learning and studying, which is what we're doing right now, either by reading books or by listening to talks or by conversation, these external kinds of learning, all that they can do is explain to you the method, the way to study inwardly. So this external learning only ta talks about how to do the internal learning. And then you must go and do this internal learning in order to come to understand Dhamma. So I want to stress that all of you must begin, that all of you should begin by studying inwardly the problems that you experience inwardly. Come to know these things. So please take a look at the problems that arise from aging, from sickness, and from death. We're afraid of aging, of sickness, and of death. All kinds of problems, very many different, different levels of problems, arise from aging, sickness, and death. What we need to do is look at these. We need to look at them like when we take sand and hold it in our hand and look at it carefully and closely until we see it clearly. This is what we need to do inwardly with aging, sickness, and death. We also have to clearly see in the same way the problems that arise from having to be separated from things we love, 
from meeting up with things we do not love and desiring something and not getting that thing. We also have to understand these problems clearly. The result, the result of these problems is in Thai Tuk or Dukkha, both physical and mental. This comes in many forms. One form is sorrow or sadness, grief, despair, crying, frustration, agony, lamentation. There's another one, it's dryness of heart, being shriveled up in Pali Upayat. Actually, what we call these things isn't so important. You don't have to know their names. Mm. What you do have to know is what these things are really like when you experience them. Mm. You have to know them inside. If you know the names for them, that's fine too. But know them as you experience them. Understand them clearly. These are the symptoms, the conditions of the diseases that we, that we have caught. These are the fruit of these diseases, the result of the diseases. And Dhamma is the cure for these rogue, for these spiritual diseases. Since it's a spiritual disease, it's, since we're concerned with spiritual disease, the Dhamma is a matter of the mind and of the spirit. The Buddha was one who came to know this disease, is one who found the cure for the disease, and is one who used the cure in order to cure himself, to free himself of the disease. After doing this, then the Buddha was able to teach the cure and the way to use the cure, to be able to teach about the disease, the cure, and the way to administer the cure to us. So please understand the Buddha in this way. If If you have some spiritual disease, Mm -hmm. then it is fitting that you be interested in the Dhamma. However, if any of you have no disease whatsoever, then it is a waste of your time to be interested in the Dhamma and you can go home. So you're invited to go home if you have no disease. (laughs) So now we'll talk about the Dhamma, which is the cure for the disease. So this Dhamma has many many levels, many stages. When we begin, we don't see it in books. We listen to people talking about it. So we study. This is the first thing. Second, then we get some knowledge of the Dhamma. Then third, we use this knowledge. So first we study the Dhamma because we don't know anything about it. Then we get some knowledge of the Dhamma. And third, we use, we apply this knowledge, we practice it. Let's go through these three things again a little differently. (laughs) No matter how much we've read and studied the Dhamma, We may have a lot of knowledge of it, but even though we have a lot of knowledge, it may not be the right kind of knowledge. So we need to study until we have the right sort of knowledge in a way that we come to the second level where we say, we have Dhamma. The first, we have knowledge of Dhamma, but then we need to have Dhamma. And only when we have Dhamma real Dhamma, genuine Dhamma, can we practice Dhamma, can we chai, can we use and apply Dhamma. So first, 
We have developed knowledge of Dhamma, theoretical knowledge, ideas, opinions about Dhamma, whatever. But we need to get to the stage where we have Dhamma, not just knowledge of it, but we have Dhamma itself, and then we can use it. So this knowledge that we, we may or may not have, we need, we need to have the right kind of knowledge, correct, proper knowledge of the Dhamma. But just having the right knowledge isn't sufficient. We have to have enough knowledge. We have to have a large enough amount of this correct knowledge. And this knowledge has to be quick. Because if it's not quick, it's never where we need it. It's never on time. Just having this knowledge somewhere back in the, of our minds doesn't, doesn't cure the spiritual disease. And so we need to be expert. We need to be very skillful in this knowledge. So it has to be correct knowledge of Dhamma. It must be sufficient. It must be quick, fast. And it must be very skillful, very expert, very efficient for it to cure the spiritual disease. So this knowledge of the Dhamma must be very, very expert, very deft, very agile, very skillful, so that not only does it is it able to understand, to come, is it able to come to know and understand the spiritual disease which is present right now, that's coming, but also the spiritual disease as it arises. So we can know this not, not just after we're suffering from it, but where we can come to know it as it arises. This is what we need to study within ourselves. This is the kind of knowledge we must, we must come to develop. You should all know that the Buddha spoke of only one thing, and he spoke of nothing else. The only thing the Buddha taught was dukkha and the end, the cessation of dukkha. The only thing the Buddha taught was about the spiritual disease and the way to cure the spiritual disease. He didn't talk about anything else. When somebody wanted, had questions about other things, the Buddha didn't want to waste his time or their time. The only thing he taught is the spiritual disease and its cure. Right now, many of us are spending our time studying all kinds of different things. There are many, many things to be curious about and be interested about, such as, after I die, will I be born again? Where will I be reborn? How will I be reborn? Please don't waste your time on these things. Don't, don't go take what time you have and concentrate it on studying dukkha and the complete and utter extinction of dukkha. This is the kind of knowledge that you need to store up. This is the kind of studying to do. Don't bother with studying other things. The Buddha only taught dukkha and the complete and total cessation of dukkha. And he said, we study it within, we study it inwardly, within the living body. Once the body dies, you don't have to be interested in this anymore. But now, while there is life, constantly, continuously study dukkha, the spiritual disease, and the total cessation of dukkha, the cure for the spiritual disease, within yourselves, inwardly. All around the world, there's no interest 
in this matter of dukkha, in the total cessation of dukkha. In all the schools all over the world, they don't, they don't pay any attention to this. In the universities, they don't study it. All, they, all that is taught in the schools and universities is cleverness, storing up lots of facts and being able to do mental tricks so that one comes out clever and that one learns a way to earn a lot of money. This is what education in the world means, being clever and earning lots of money. But they completely ignore dukkha and the cessation, the total end of dukkha. We believe that education in this world is not complete. It is imperfect because all that's being studied in all the schools and universities is just two things. A general base of knowledge about external things and the second is how to make a living. That's all they teach, two things. This is incomplete. The schools and universities don't teach anything about how to be a complete human being, how to be a human being free of dukkha, free of spiritual disease. So this is why we consider the education that goes on in the world to be insufficient and incomplete. But it is correct and proper that each of you have come here in order to study this third kind of education, that you have come here to, to learn about what is the way that we can be human beings, how do we live as human beings so that we are free of dukkha, so that we are free of the spiritual disease, so that we are free of problems. This is the correct kind of education and it is good that each of you have come here to get and got have become to be interested in this. The shortest way to say this is we've come here to study how what do I do to be human? What do we do to be human? If somebody tells you that you're not human, please don't get angry and please don't be sad. First you have to look and see what it means to be human. What is it like to be human? What is humanness? The word manut is a Thai word which comes from a Pali word, manut saya. This is a very good word which the meaning of it is very useful. Literally, it means one whose mind is high, one whose mind is on a high level. This means that so we can use the simile of if a flood comes, the mind is above the flood. The mind is above a flood of problems. So to be human in this sense, means to have a mind that is on a high level, that is on a level above problems. This is what it means to be human. As for this word human that, that the translator here has been using, um, I'm not sure what it means, <laughs> but we, we can take a guess that this word man comes from the word mana, which in Pali or Sanskrit means mind and hue maybe it, it means high also so maybe this English word human has the same meaning as manut one who has a mind on a high level or a, a high level mind if, if this guess is true well then these these two words are the same human and manut are the same so the Dhamma is the kind of knowledge that, that tells us exactly what it means to be human. The Dhamma is the, the knowledge of 
how to be human, what it is to be human, what human me- being human means, so that we are completely human, fully human, not just masquerading in bodies that look like humans. If you're really human, then you are above problems. So come and learn and study so that you can be completely human. Work, practice, study in order to have a mind, a spirit that is above all problems. The problem we're talking about here is dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, suffering, the spiritual disease. This problem is dukkha. This problem are things that we cannot endure, things that we cannot tolerate. When this, when these problems arise, we can't stand them. And so we have to run around trying to avoid them, trying to get away from them. This causes agitation. We are, we're not comfortable, we're not happy. We're not, we don't have a, a feeling of of wellness. And so this word dukkha, this problem, the meaning of this word dukkha is not unendurable. It means unendurable, intolerable. We can't, we can't put up with it. We can't stand it. We can't tolerate it. So we'd like to repeat one more time to write, to reiterate that If you don't have any problems, if you don't have any dukkha, then you don't need to waste your time studying the Dhamma. You might as well go home. But if you happen to have any a problem, (laughs) just one little problem or many, then take a look at it. Stick around and practice looking at these problems. Find a way, find, take a look at finding the cure and then learn how to use the cure. I will be bold enough to say that everyone has problems. Everyone. So everyone ought to be studying the Dhamma. And that the problems that each of us, all the problems, <coughs> All the problems that each of us have are the same. It's the same problem. So this, this problem that we all have, this one same problem, is what we were talking about the, at the beginning. It's the problem that comes from aging, illness, and death. From the fact that we can't get, we can't, all the things, we can't have all the things that we want. That we can't keep this body surviving forever exactly how we want it to be. That we can't have things our way all the time. This is the same problem for each and every one of us. So at this point, we have to use a a scientific method or a method that is like science in order to solve this problem, to cure this disease. The reason we will use a scientific method is because methods like philosophy and logic are unable to solve the problems, to solve this problem. So therefore we will use scientific, we will use a scientific approach that is able to to solve the problem. Right now in the world people really like philosophy. There are all kinds of philosophies about all kinds of things. The problem with these philosophies is they can't solve the problem. They may be fun and interesting, but they don't solve the problem. So this is why we're going to use a scientific approach, a way that is scientific, that can, that will solve the problem. So now at this point, Please reflect on something that you've probably all, all heard about already. 
So please reflect, reflect on the four noble truths, the Ariya Sat, the four Ariya Sat, noble truths. The four noble truths are a scientific principle of the mind that is the center of Buddhism. With the Four Noble Truths, we are able to study the exact problem as it is. We don't have to rely on hypotheses. Most of us are familiar with hypotheses in the scientific method where we make an hypothesis or a hypothesis and then we test it out and see if it goes this way or that way. And we make guesses, we make predictions about these hypotheses, about, well, if, if this happens, that will happen, or da 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 But with the Four Noble Truths, we don't need to do this. We don't have to make up hypotheses. We don't have to have these fictions of hypotheses. Instead, we look exactly and directly at reality. Four Noble Truths are, one, Dukkha, two, the cause of Dukkha, three, if we extinguish the cause, then we extinguish Dukkha. If we put out the cause, we put out Dukkha. And four, the way, the path to put out the cause so that there is no more Dukkha. This has the characteristics of science. It has the reasoning of science. It has the methods of science. We are able to apply it with real things, with reality, with truth. We don't have to use hypotheses. When we study books, all we're doing is studying hypotheses, ideas and opinions, opinions. Even if we're reading a book about the Four Noble Truths, it's still just hypotheses. This is not science, it's just philosophy. Philosophy is always inviting us to play around with hypotheses. But this isn't Buddhism. If we want to be scientific, the way to study the Four Noble Truths scientifically is to study the real thing, not the hypotheses, not the theory, not the ideas and opinions about the real thing. Study the real thing itself. Study dukkha as you experience it. Come to know the cause of dukkha. Experience that cause. Come to know that there is an end to dukkha, which comes about by ending the cause, and know the path that leads to the end of the cause and to the end of dukkha. So we don't have to use these hypotheses. Just reading books and listening to talks about Buddhism is not Buddhism. It's just hypotheses about Buddhism. What you need to do is come to know the opposite thing of these hypotheses. What's on the other side? What you need to come to know is the practice, the experience, the reality of these Four Noble Truths. Don't get stuck in this hypothesis, but look inside, study inside, and see these things as they really happen. As long as you're dealing with hypotheses, as long as you're asking questions only on an intellectual level, as long as, as long as your understanding is only intellectual or philosophical, that's, this isn't Buddhism. You're just playing around with ideas about Buddhism. You, you haven't even come close yet. To really know what Buddhism is, 
we deal with reality, not opinions about reality, not the hypotheses and the theories. So, make sure you look at reality. Don't just look at philosophy. If you study Buddhism from books, you'll always come away with the idea that Buddhism is a philosophy. This is because most of the people writing books about Buddhism are approaching it like philosophy. They do not understand Buddhism, and so all they can do is come up with philosophies about Buddhism. They don't know what they're talking about. So all these books that people are reading about Buddhism can only, they'll keep telling you that Buddhism is a philosophy. This is completely wrong. This has nothing to do with Buddhism, and it is not the truth. These books may help you a little bit, but they are not Buddhism. Buddhism is not philosophy, no matter how many professors and scholars tell you that it is. This idea that Buddhism is a philosophy, just keep it, a, put it aside for a while, lock it up in a drawer somewhere, and take a look at the Four Noble Truths inside. Study dukkha within yourself. Study the cause of dukkha. Study the end of dukkha and the way that leads to the end of dukkha. If you've studied these, learned something about them, and been able to put it into practice, then after a while you'll be able to put an end to some dukkha. And when you can end some dukkha, then you'll know that Buddhism is not a philosophy. When you have studied the Four Noble Truths enough to put, put, to put an end to some dukkha, then you'll know that Buddhism is a science. You know that not only is it a science, but you'll also know that it's a religion. By religion we mean something that ties man to the highest thing. So you'll know that Buddhism is a science and a religion together. That Buddhism is a religion which can go together with science. Everything that science comes to understand genuinely Buddhism can accept. It is not at odds with science. Mm -hmm. And so when you come to this, you realize that Buddhism is not a philosophy. It has all the... Even though some philosophers claim that philosophy is a science, you'll come to know that Buddhism is a science and a religion together. If you're like most people in the world, you will not accept that Buddhism is a religion. This is because most people believe that a religion must have God, must believe in a God or many gods. If this is your understanding, it's, it's rather shallow. Why don't you look at it this way, that there are two kinds of religion. There are theistic religions and atheist, atheistic religions. Theistic religions postulate a God as the highest thing. Believers in these theistic religions believe in a God or gods. Buddhism is atheistic. It does not believe in a personal God. Buddhism does not postulate or hypothesize about a personal God. But Buddhism believes in truth. Buddhism teaches about truth, the deepest, most significant truths about humanity and about life. These truths, this truth, the Four Noble Truths, these are the highest thing. These truths in Buddhism are equivalent to the God or the gods of theistic religions. Both kinds of religion are based on some highest thing. In Buddhism, that highest thing is impersonal. 
It doesn't have a personality. In theistic religions, that highest thing has a personality. It's some individual power or being. If you, if you look up the word religion in the dictionary, and it's a dictionary that tells where the word came from, it comes from the rat, Latin word re, religare, which has, which scholars of Latin back with Cicero and old timers like that weren't sure whether this word came from the root lig or leg. Leg means to observe. Lig means to bind. The word religion means to bind or to observe in, the, in terms of to do, to practice, to the highest thing. Religion means that which man observes, that which binds man, man to the supreme thing. This is the meaning of religion. It has nothing to do with God. The, word, the meaning of the word religion doesn't have anything to do with God. Buddhism, if you want, has a God. The God of Buddhism is the law of nature. It's the way things work. One of the ways we describe this is itapajayata. Itapajayata means if this is, that this comes into being. It's the law of cause and effect. It's the law of nature. So if you want, Buddhism has a God too. Except the God of Buddhism is not a personal God. The law of nature is an impersonal God. So Buddhism has a God too if you believe that all religions should have a God. But just remember that this God of Buddhism is the law of nature, and it's an impersonal God. Many of the academics and writers who write books, or, excuse me, many of the Western or Farang academics, scholars, and book writers who come up with their their theses and things about Buddhism. They keep saying that Buddhism is a philosophy that's not, that it's not a religion. This is based on their own misunderstanding. They haven't even looked up the word religion in the dictionary and they're writing books about it. So please, don't jump to conclusions about what religion is. Understand that Buddhism is also a religion. Don't make the same mistake that these scholars have made and think that religion must have some sort of personal God. Religions with a personal God are one kind of religion. Buddhism is another kind of religion that has an impersonal God. This impersonal God may even be a higher kind of God than the personal kind of God. But the main thing is to understand that Buddhism is also a religion. It is a scientific religion. It is based on scientific principles, not on mere belief, not on mere rituals. It is based on practice, on experimentation, on study, on direct intuitive experience. So. Please never forget that Buddhism is a religion. It is something which binds, which ties man to the highest thing. In most religions, there is a creator of some sort. In most religions, the creator is a personal God, an individualistic God with a personality of some sort. Buddhism also has a creator. There is a creator. But this creator is an impersonal God. It's the law of nature. It's Dhamma. Especially in the sense, Dhamma in the sense of Itapajayata, which means if this is, this comes into being, and this comes into being, and this, and this, and this. It's the law of cause and effect. That the process of things causing something else continually on and on. It's an evolution, a natural evolutionary process. 
This is the creator in Buddhism. So there are two kinds of God, two kinds of creator, a personal creator and an impersonal creator. If you've understood what, what's, been, what's being said, then you'll be able to see for yourselves, be able to study and observe and know for yourselves that dukkha and the end of dukkha, this is an impersonal God. Then you'll understand Dhamma. You'll understand Dhamma exactly where Dhamma is, exactly what Dhamma is about. You'll know the Dhamma, you'll know that it's a science and that it is not a mere philosophy. This, this point here is very important. It will ensure that you practice properly and correctly in accordance with Buddhism, in line with the Dhamma. If you always remember that the Dhamma is a scientific way of practice to come to understand dukkha, the cause of dukkha, the cessation of dukkha, and the way that leads to the cessation of dukkha. If you always remember this, then it will ensure that you practice Buddhism properly. It will ensure that you do not get yourselves into problems by practicing things which are not Buddhism. So keep this in mind and it will protect you in your practice of the Dhamma. If you have this kind of knowledge, it means that you have the medicine. But having the medicine isn't enough. If we've got a headache and we've got aspirin in the, in the bathroom, our headache doesn't go away. So we've got the knowledge, we've also got to use it. We've got the cure. We need to take the cure. Knowledge enough isn't, isn't sufficient. Knowledge alone is not enough. We need to take the cure. We need to practice it. So if we take this cure for the spiritual disease, if we take this spiritual cure, then we will be cured. And that will mean a spirit that is emancipated, a spirit that is free, free of dukkha and free of problems. All religions talk about emancipation or freedom, but only Buddhism talks about freedom from all diseases, freedom from all problems. All the problems that we, were dis we discussed at the beginning, all the rogue that we discussed at the beginning. So if we take, if we study and put into practice Buddhism, then we will go beyond, we will, we will be delivered from, we will break free of all these problems, all these diseases. I hope that you understand the general principles and the genuine goal, the genuine aim of this knowledge and practice. If you do, then you will be able to steadily solve your problems more and more. You'll continually be able to come to terms with and cure your spiritual disease. So, if you have this right kind of under, if you have the correct understanding of the general principles and you understand the aim, this will ensure that you practice properly and that you avoid making further problems. Our goal is to solve our problems, not to create new ones. So, if you understand what has been said, you will be able to proceed in the study and in the cure of spiritual disease. More details on this will have to wait till next time because time is, is up. So let's call it an end for today. So one more time before you go, I'd like to express my happiness and joy 
at the right practice, the right action of all of you in coming to, to work on this problem, on this disease. And I'd also like to thank you all once, once more for helping to make this place useful and beneficial. That's all.